Hi, it's Robin. One thing that us nerds like to do is to try to determine what was first at doing something. Answering questions like, what was the first personal computer? Or, what was the first video game? Nerds go crazy about this stuff. It gives us something to argue with other nerds about. Here's another nerd question. What was the first stealth game? Now, what is a stealth game? Okay, well, here's some newfangled examples from my collection. They're games where you try to sneak around undetected, or at least you have the option of playing that way. Your enemies don't know where you are until they see or hear you. In most early video games, the enemies either always knew where you were and they just relentlessly pursued you, or they just didn't really care where you were and just followed a path over and over again. But in a stealth game, the enemy might have some sort of patrol mode where they're following a pattern looking for you, and then once you're found, they pursue you. Now, of course, this is hardly a definitive collection of these games, but maybe you've played some of these, and they've certainly become a major element of many types of games, even if they're not, strictly speaking, stealth games. Now, until recently, I would have guessed that the first stealth game was Castle Wolfenstein, which was released in 1981 for the Apple II, even if I didn't play it until the 1983 release on the Commodore 64. Thanks to the Fat Man for his help with getting this footage of the C64 version. And of course, Castle Wolfenstein went on to inspire Wolfenstein 3D, which really popularized the first-person shooter genre of game. Well, it turns out there's a game even before Castle Wolfenstein that many nerds consider to be the first ever stealth game. It was developed in Japan in 1979 by Hiroshi Suzuki, and it's called Manbiki Shonen, or Manbiki Sayanin, sorry for my Japanese pronunciation, which translates to shoplifting boy. Now, this game and this story was probably first covered in an interview with the game's developer by writer John Shishapanyuk and published in his 2014 book, The Untold History of Japanese Game Developers, Volume 1. It looks like an excellent book. I don't have it yet, but it's on my list to buy. And there was also a really good video about Shoplifting Boy back in 2017 on the channel Stealth Docs. And that appears to be a channel dedicated to stealth gaming. So I recommend you check out that video if you want to hear more of the story about Mambiki Shonen. In that video, some footage of the game is shown, and it's described how this game was first developed and released for the Commodore Pet. Now, you might know I'm a bit of a Commodore nerd, and I realized right away that the footage shown in that video was not for the pet. I think it's footage from the NEC PC6001, a computer that was popular in Japan. Shoplifting Boy was ported to the PC6001 afterwards, and so footage of that version was available. Stealth Docs couldn't find footage of the original pet game, and that's because it seems that the pet version was lost. Nobody seemed to have a copy. Now, I should also mention that Jim Jerry, the ultra-prolific TRS-80 MC-10 programmer that I've mentioned a couple times before on the channel, he wrote an excellent blog entry about Shoplifting Boy about five years ago, and of course, he ported the game to the MC-10 as well. But Jim used the PC-6001 version as the basis for his MC-10 game as well. A port of a port. Okay, and of course, I'll have links to all these things I've mentioned in the video description. Okay, so finally, getting to the news, to the new development, I got a tip from Ryan Devon that the pet version of Mambiki Shonen, Shoplifting Boy, was found. In fact, it wasn't very lost at all. It's just that most of us didn't know where to look. Turns out that the pet game had been published in a computer magazine in Japan in early 1980 as a type-in listing. Somebody got a copy of that magazine, they scanned it, and they put it up on their website in Japan. 
but it just didn't turn up in English language searches, I suppose, for the people who were searching for the game. I only got involved with this when somebody told me about it in the last couple months. So unfortunately, I don't have a copy of the magazine, so I'll just be showing the pages from the scan. Here's the front cover, and you can see it's from Random Access Magazine. I believe it's the February 1980 issue. I find this fascinating. I, I really wish I knew Japanese, <laughs> because there's a lot of interesting computer history that went on there that a lot of us don't know about. But you can see through here, and the PET 2001 is mentioned. And the English translation of that is roughly PET 2001 Shoplifting Boy Game. And here's the actual article on page 73. And I've got a translation of this here. <laughs> so in the top left corner, it's this is the Juvenile Delinquency Series <laughs> Shoplifting Boy. Play with PET 2001 8K. Apparently that is the designer and programmer of the game, Hiroshi Suzuki, pretending to shoplift himself. <laughs> and we'll read a little bit of the intro here. Introduction of characters, Shoplifter, a naughty shoplifter who sneaks into superstores that are open late at night when he receives a job request. He's intimidated by Warden Kikuyama and becomes stiff when he encounters him. Warden K is an ugly warden dispatched by the Ministry of Education. His real name is Kikiyama. He has a specialty in bond dance and spends his days and nights at the supermarket trying to catch Shoplifter A. Now, apparently this is how it really happened. One day in January 1980, Mr. Tomoyuki Inu, the development manager of our development division, was wandering around a supermarket when a commercial song suddenly came on and Shoplifter A appeared. Mr. Inu spread the bread layer he had been eating and succeeded in luring A. The following is a reprint of the conversation between Shoplifter A and Mr. Inu. Mr. Inu, who are you? Boy A. Momotero was born from a peach. I'm forgiven. Hmm, I see. So why do you shoplift? Cane? Vacuum. I want to eat a man. Mr. Inu, he's a naughty guy. What is your specialty? All right, now the game manual. Well, this game is about shoplifting items from a superstore without being spotted by Warden K. Shoplifting Boy A is controlled by you, and you are given the mission to shoplift all the items in the store before it closes at 11 p.m. Run will start the game. To request a job from A, press the S key. There's a diagram about how the keyboard controls are. And also a diagram for sound effects. This is the same one that Space Invaders used. This hack was very popular, apparently in Japan as well. It even gives a diagram of how to get the sound from the user port. Down the bottom right corner, there's a description of the different variables, what they do. I've got some screenshots, even a flowchart. And then there's the actual program listing. Okay, so we'll be trying the game today on the Time Mouth Mini Pet 4080, made by Dave Curran at Time Mouth in association with Rod from The Future Was 8 Bit. So, this is a recreation of a Commodore Pet, all made with real ICs, no emulation here. Yes, I know people like it when I say they're real. I've also got my SD to Pet Future SD card reader, which really is a must have if you have a Commodore Pet or the Mini Pet. I'm also going to be using this Commodore Pet Companion from Rudy's Retro Intel. This hooks into the user port. The Mini Pet already has great composite video out, but later I'll be trying this on one of my vintage pets. So I'll try the composite out on that. And even on this one, I'll be using it for the audio out here. It also has this nine pin port, which is for hooking up an RGB to HDMI adapter. Now I don't have one of those yet. Okay, so thanks very much to Rudy for sending this to me. If you're interested in game one, I'll put his contact info in the video description. Rudy told me that all the proceeds from the sales are going to a local food bank. And if you haven't checked out Rudy's channel, Rudy's Retro Intel, again, link in the video description. Oh yeah, it needs power for the composite video, but I won't be using that yet. I might use that later. Okay, so there'll be a D64 of this game. On your PEF, if you got a newer one, you can do a catalog, C Shift A, and see all the different files. Really, 
I've got six different versions of the game here, but you can just load the first file on the disk called menu and run that. Pocketing something from a store. So I made this menu system and to play the original game exactly as it was listed in that magazine, that is option one. I want to preserve the original feature it or honor it <laughs> by keeping it at the top of the list. So we'll try that one first. Original game, press one. And here we go. Play, pocketing something from a store, Manbiki Sayanin. I think that Shonen, most listings had this game called Manbiki Shonen. And I guess it's just kind of like a transliteration thing. I, I really don't know. One of you knows Japanese. This is a pretty great intro. Mon Baseo Kenshin. I don't entirely know what's going on there, but it's a neat little intro. It's actually a lot like Space Invaders. And I believe the original programmer was very inspired by Space Invaders, which was a huge hit in Japan, well, worldwide, but it really started in Japan, as far as I know. There were arcades full of just Space Invaders games. And so it's pretty neat that this game has this interesting little intro here, that play and the animation very much like Space Invaders, uh, but of course themed to this shoplifting game. Okay, so press S to start. And I don't really understand why you are the guy on the left, and yet A is the shoplifter, and in goes the shoplifter into the superstore. Oh well. Okay, and to play, you use this little cluster of keys, two to go up, zero left, dot to go down, and minus. Now this cluster is kind of very specific to the pet keyboard. Most other keyboards don't have the minus key down here, and maybe they don't have the decimal here. So anyway, that's why I created the other versions. I guess we should be playing the game here instead of talking about that. Okay, so the shoplifter is that character A. And then that warden or whatever we want to call him is patrolling at the top. And this is why it's like a stealth game. He doesn't know where you are. He doesn't come after you till he sees you. And here we have to move. And the goal is to grab all these items off the shelf. Ah! <laughs> and you have to do it before 11 p.m. closing. There's actually like 136 items to grab. <laughs> I don't know why they're dollar signs. I guess they're just items representing one. Each one's worth a hundred, well, a hundred dollars, but I guess it's like a hundred yen, which is like one dollar. You can't be content with just shoplifting a few items. You got to clear the store right out. Oh, oh, you got me. Koi. <laughs> Close. Superstore Ikibun. Mati, police. Kick. Bakame. <laughs> I don't know how to say these words, sorry. <laughs> there, so I lost. I got caught. So yeah, here it is. The first stealth game ever according to some nerds. <laughs> okay, so just talk about the game a little bit more here. I'll S to start. Yeah, it is really neat that it has these intro scenes and so on. Of course, they're a little bit annoying to watch over and over again, but in 1979, 1980, uh, you know, this is pretty, very novel. Oh yeah, did I say it was space, uh, the space bar or space button to grab the mic? Okay, so the reason for me having six versions, one thing I noticed about this game is that as impressive as it is, there it's got it's got some problems. You see how the character's flickering away? And there's actually quite a bit of lag. Uh, let's see here. Basically, I'm moving as fast as I can. Oh, 
and you can get caught if you keep pressing keys. Oh, so basically there's a bit of lag. The game just doesn't, it's, it's not running as fast as, and when you have to get 136 of these, I think there are, that lag and so on is, can be a bit frustrating. It makes the game not quite as fun as it, I think it could be. I kind of like this challenge of trying to clear the whole screen of all those dollars. It's got a little bit of a uh, Pac-Man element in it too, in a sense. Uh, there's all those, just like clearing all the dots. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the menu here. I'm just going to press reset. I'll use the fancy little menu that's built into the mini pad. So just to explain this menu a little bit more, number one is the original game with that two zero dot minus cluster. Now the thing is that does not work well. If you want to play this on a pet emulator, your emulator isn't going to have that key cluster in a nice playable way probably. So option two is to play with the cursor keys. Now in a Commodore pet, that isn't such a great option because you just have down and right and then you have to shift to go up and left. And while I'm totally fine with that, a lot of people would rather have a dedicated key for each direction. So if you're playing on a modern computer with inverted T cursor keys, option two is probably good for you. And option three is the eight, four, five, six cluster, which will work on a lot of emulators, assuming you have a numeric keypad. And it's also a very classic control scheme for real pets because all Commodore pets have a number pad on them. And they would often use as kind of like a D pad or a fairly standardized control scheme. They would use eight for up, four for left, six for right, and either two for down or five for down. I went with the more modern five. So there's three other options, optimized. And this is what I actually spent a number of days working on rewriting the main game code just to be faster. So I'll show you that now. So we'll, I'll choose option four. So it's the regular control scheme. And what I tried to do is leave the game as exactly the same as possible. I'll press S to start it. I didn't touch the intros, the menus at all. They are exactly the same. Okay, but what I did was I got rid of all the flickering for the player. Uh, the whole game runs faster now. You see that the shopkeeper also moves faster. There's just a lot less lag. The flicker is gone. Ooh. And I did keep it all in basic. I didn't want to use machine code because I wanted it to still be uh, appropriate a type in listing that would could have gone in that magazine back in the day. It still fits in eight kilobytes. In fact, I made it a little bit shorter. I optimized for speed, not size, but I did make it a little bit shorter at the same time. Okay. So the game is a little bit easier in a way because that time actually is still running in real time. And I still had it closed at 11 PM. Oh, the shopkeeper keeps coming back here. So because you move faster, in a way you have more time to complete the level. Uh, but on the other hand, the game's kind of more tricky because it's actually easier for you to get, wah, easier to get caught <laughs> with him moving faster and the whole game running faster. So strictly speaking, you shouldn't really compare, like if you're comparing your high score, if you finish the game in a certain amount of time, um, you should really state whether you're playing the optimized game or the original. Okay, so I tried to, basically I did all this optimization, uh, try to stay in the spirit of honoring the game. I want to keep the original preserved for historical reasons. And if you want to play the original, there it is. Um, but I added the improvements just so maybe the game would seem a little bit more fun and modern, uh, just to make it snappier. And I think it's a bit more fun this way. 
Ah! Oh, that was close. <laughs> Basically, he doesn't even spot you if you stand partly obscured like this. That's how the original game was, so I just left it like that. He only sees you if you're right out in the uh, in the aisle. I should try and finish the game, eh? Ah, getting greedy. <laughs> if he had reversed right there, he would have had me. I didn't wait for him to go far enough away. Okay, you can kind of go for broke once, uh, when you've got only one aisle left to clear. And you don't have to worry about getting back out again. Here we go. Oh my. <laughs> I love these little animations. Yokoyana Banzai. Victory. <laughs> Okay, I feel like I've been rambling a lot, but I wanted to explain just why why I did the menus that way. So all six versions of the game there are standalone. So I'll just do a directory. One problem when I was working on this is I found that on the pad, I learned that programs can load other programs, but the first program must be longer than any other file that it loads. So I had to deliberately bloat the menu up so it was bigger than any of the other files. I know they appear to all be just 28 blocks here. Each block is 254 bytes. The menu is at least a handful of bytes longer than the longest of any of the other versions of the game. And so I prefer you kept all these files together on the 1D64. If for some reason you do need to separate them, uh, Mambiki Sainan is the original one, and then the dash C means the cursor version and means the numeric keypad version. Well, the number one, uh, 8456, the original is the 20 dot minus. And then Shoplifting Boy is my optimized version. I put the English name on just, I guess, because I don't know Japanese. So it's the same thing, the original control scheme, the cursor, and then the number control scheme. But each of those is a standalone file that you can run. And just to load up, Mambiki, sign in, comma eight. Okay, I think it's pretty neat that they included a flow chart in here. So at the beginning of the program, all the variables are initialized. Those strings, H string, A string, and C string are just kind of helpers. Like H is for horizontal positioning, although it seems to me it's more like vertical positioning. That string is used to just quickly locate a certain line downwards by printing from the left of that string. A string prints out a row of the store. C string blanks out a row. And then line 100 initializes a bunch of variables. According to the little chart, X and Y are the shoplifter's location. X1 and Y1 are the shoplifter's previous location, which backtracks sometimes. Variable A is the warden's position. Variable Q is the direction of movement of the observer, it says, but I think that's the warden's movement direction. V is the address for pitch determination. It's actually how fast that timer operates on the user port, but it's used for music or sound effects. S is the number of items that have been shoplifted. And K is the constants related to VRAM addresses. That is, it's one less than the start of screen memory, 32768. If we list from 580, 870, that's what displays the attract mode on the title screen. Lines 900 through 920 basically keep checking in periodically to see if the S key was pressed to start a game. If so, 
940 through 989. All that prints the intro to the game where the shoplifter and the mysterious Mr. Inui agree about the shoplifting heist and the shoplifter goes into the store. 2000 to 230. That sets up the whole store display. All those aisles are printed, and then the closing time of 11 p.m. is set. 2030 resets the internal time clock to 3 p.m. One minute represents one hour in the game. So the maximum length of the game is about eight minutes, representing eight hours to shoplift all the items. Line 3000 updates the time display. Line 3002 checks, has it hit 11 p.m. yet? If so, it's game over, going to line 10,000. Is your score 13,600? That means you've stolen all 136 items. If so, then you've won the game. Go to line 20,000. Otherwise, line 3004 gets your input for the character movement. Lines 3005 through 3045. Stores your old position in X1 and Y1, and then checks for the keyboard movement. And these are the lines I changed for the different control schemes. But basically in each one, if it's minus, then that's moving to the right. Increment X, then do a peek of screen memory to check. Is there a blank space there? And that's the collision detection. And each following line is for going left, going up, going down. And it's basically the a repeat of the same code with slight tweaks for the different collision detection. And then lines 3041 through 3044, check for the boundaries of the screen so you can't move off the screen. Not even sure those are really necessary, but that's how it's implemented here. Well, for sure the top one is, so you can't move up into the aisle where the warden is wandering around. I'm not sure about some of the other ones because it seems to me that there's shelves blocking the sides of the screen anyway. Oh well. 30, 46, or 3, 1117. This group of lines move the shoplifter and also animate him so he's alternating between his two different frames and also is he facing left or right and then the way he kind of walks. Lines 3120 through 3170. Check if you press the space bar to try and shoplift. It goes ahead here and animates the shoplifting. Also checks to see, is there something to, there to steal? And if so, increment your score by 100. And it does the little sound effect right here. This is how all the sound effects are. Usually just little, short little loops and poking different values into that frequency register. Lines 4000 through 4090. This is the movement of the warden at the top of the screen. Rather than having an X and a Y position, he just uses A to represent his distance from the left edge of the screen in characters. And there's this little random check here to see which direction he should move. So that's how he periodically reverses direction. It doesn't have anything to do with the shoplifter's position. It's just kind of a random thing, but it gives him kind of a, a nice element of surprise. You don't know when he's going to turn around and come back the other way. And line 4050 just toggles between the two different frames of animation he has. And then 4060 through 4090 kind of mirrors it so that he can walk, he can run left or right, but he's like waving his arms in two different frames each way. 4095 to 4200. Okay, and that is the whole check right there to see if the warden has spotted the player. And really all it's doing is checking if the warden and the player's X and Y positions are overlapping enough, then he's spotted. And otherwise he's not, he just continues on. Okay, so those are the lines from 3000 to 4200 that I optimized, uh, but I tried to keep the logic identical, just make it all run faster. So I'll probably get into that in another video that you'll see sometime. Sooner if you're a patron, probably. Lines 5000 through 5180, that's the warden. He's tracked the player and he comes after him and grabs him. 
And once he's grabbed, then you go to the game losing screen, which is all the way from 10,000 to 11,440. Maybe I'll play that back in slow-mo. <laughs> but again, it's these animations that are just basically a bunch of prints and then delays and sound effects. But it's just a very, it's, it's very much like it's scripted. It's very linear, pretty much no decision making during that time or very minimal amount. It's basically a, a scripted animation. Okay, if you happen to win, then that is starting at lines 20,000. And again, it's a scripted animation. And then finally, 30,000 and 30,001. Those are the note data for that little jingle at the beginning of the game. I'll just list the whole program one more time here and play it in slow-mo or pause it if you want to study any particular part of it. And of course, you can just download these programs, load them up in a pet emulator or on your real pet, and list them to your heart's content if you want to examine them more than we have here today. Okay, and finally, just a little bit of history about the game from that magazine, the very last page of it. I love how this magazine gets into all the details of the game. This game was developed to be exhibited at the University of Tokyo Kamaba Festival held in late November last year, that was 1979, in the Enthusiasm Era Game Edition project of our Game Development Division. We would like to thank Mr. Mikio Ikeda of Commodore Japan for his great cooperation in this development. Okay, so that's why this game is dated as 1979. It was completed and demonstrated at the University of Tokyo. It was kind of released at this festival, so to speak. But even February 1980, the publication of the magazine is well before Castle Wolfenstein 1981. The game was so popular at the Kamaba Festival that it was running for 72 hours. Among the many people who became professional shoplifters during this time, the one with the best record, Mr. Takafumi Sato, our club manager, had an amazing record of 6.41 p.m. Please try to set a record yourself. And again, if you play the original version, it's more difficult to get that 6.41 time. Uh, although I have managed to get, I think, about 6.20. And on the optimized version, I've finished before 6 p.m. at 5-something. Also, when I brought this game to the RAM editorial department for this magazine after the Kamaba Festival, the editorial department seemed quite taken aback by the absurdity of the title. However, we somehow got the okay and decided to publish it. Okay, notes. When saving this program, be sure to directly execute poke 59467,59466,0, poke 59464,0 before saving. Otherwise, you will not be able to save. This is not a joke. Okay. <laughs> this game is scheduled to be commercialized by a certain manufacturer. I've heard rumors that this was meant to be published by Taito. They went on to maybe adapt this game into what became Lupin, Lupin game, Lupin the Third, which is actually related to that Tomy game about Lupin that I showed in a video a while ago, I guess. Get a hint from this game and engage in similar acts on the street, prohibited by Hiroshi Suzuki. So yeah, he wrote that ending there. I actually found another interview with Hiroshi Suzuki. And Mr. Suzuki said, the first game I ever played was Space Invaders, the tabletop version. I entered university in 1979, and that was around the time when Space Invaders was very popular. As for making the games, I knew about type-in programs for the TK-80, launched by NEC in 1976, the first Japan-built commercial computer. The TK stands for Training Kit. It was designed as a platform for learning to program and use computers. NEC used it as the base for its trailblazing PC-8001, 8801, and 9801, appearing in a magazine called I.O., the first Japanese computer magazine. Magazines printed source code for games, including versions of Space Invaders, but I wasn't at all familiar with computers or coding, and that motivated me to join the University of Tokyo Computer Club, 
We looked at things like hardware, compilers, Lisp, and so on, but soon it became a games club due to the wicked effects of myself and Mr. Takaguchi. I was one year above Mr. Takaguchi, and I majored in aeronautics. When I joined the university, we were still in the era of analog computers, so we were at the start of the first shift to more modern-style computers. I made a flight simulator, a small one, but my professors thought it was impressive. I felt they understood and could see the potential and the fact that computers were going to be the future. But I didn't buy one for myself. The PET 2001 it was very expensive, and I was just at university. So I pretty much spent all my free time at a showroom for the PET in Aoyama, I hope I say that right, where you could go and use them and see games. There was also one in Akihabara, and that is where we know that HAL Laboratory got its start. And apparently their computer club somehow struck a deal with Taito. Taito would provide computers and a bit of money to them, and the computer club would hand over whatever games they made to Taito. So here is the original Mambiki Shonen running on my vintage Commodore PET 2001N from 1979. So this is right about the same era when this game was originally written. It was probably written on the 1978 2001 with the chiclet keyboard, but this one's running a bit better for me right now, so we're using this model. I want to make it clear I love that mini pet. It's fantastic to have a reliable, light, portable machine, but I also love the originals, of course. So I just want to show it briefly running on here. So thanks again to Rudy's Retro Intel for the pet companion, which I'm using right now to capture the composite video and the audio from this pet. You might notice some extra dots on the screen, and that's not the capture's fault. It's actually a fault with this 2001N that seems to be due to some of the 74 series TTL in the display circuit running too fast or slow. The leftmost pixel of each character seems to be mirrored at the rightmost edge of a character. It's kind of strange. Okay, I want to make sure I thank Rudy for his help with suggestions of repairing my pets. And especially Chuck Hutchins and his excellent videos on his YouTube channel about pet repair, and both Rod and Dave at The Future Was 8 Bit and Time Out Software. And huge apologies if I forgot anyone. Oh. I really wanted to show this running on vintage hardware, and I spent so long trying to repair my pets. I'm glad I did. But I haven't been getting as many videos done as I would like in the meantime. Okay, so you can grab a copy of this game, the D64, a link in the video description. There is so much to check out in the video description for this video. Oh, 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 oh. Get out of there. oh, one, two. Oh, he turned around at the last moment. Okay, and finally, I actually did find. Just after I'd finished making this video almost, I found video of the pet version of the game on YouTube from 2022, and I don't know what to make of that. Now, it's pretty low quality for 2022, recorded in just 480p with bad scaling, so the pixels seem to be of uneven size. Maybe it was just recorded on a bad emulator? I don't know. So I don't think I wasted my time here. And of course now the game should be better preserved in the D64 file. And maybe we've increased the awareness of the game uh, outside of Japan. So thank you very much to my patrons for their support. Thank you to all the people who have assisted the tips to help in getting this made. Ah! Oh! <laughs> and all the different people who over the years have done the research and uh, contributed to the knowledge of stealth games and this little game and its piece of history. And of course, thanks to Hiroshi Suzuki and his whole computer club, Back in 1979, 1980, RAM Magazine, 
just amazing all the neat bits of computer history that went on that those of us in the West are pretty ignorant of. Japan has a fascinating video game history before Nintendo, and I'd love it if we could shed more light on some of those neat things that happened there. Uh. Oh, he turned around. Oh, oh I'm done. 10,900. Okay, thanks very much to my patrons for their support. Thank you for watching, and we'll talk to you next time. Sure.